this is the first lecture of the course, which is called Brownian Motion and Stochastic Calculus. And this is a part of uh, the special year, one year master program in Geneva University in math, which is devoted to statistical physics, mostly in 2D, but not only. And uh, let me start with some general remarks about this course, like the very first chapter or paragraph will be some introduction and reminders. So let me try to say briefly what's that about. Uh, probably most of you already heard about, heard this, the same Brownian motion and I fairly believe that some of you actually even, you know, uh, took some course on this or maybe maybe heard some mini course, attended mini course, etc. <coughs> so the Brownian motion is a continuous object, so that, that's important. I mean, in other courses of this program, basically what we or you deal with is some model in discrete, like the Eason model presented by even day before yesterday which is okay, some, some discrete system, maybe just of finite size, maybe of infinite size, then the set of, the set of faces is countable, anyway. And then the questions we are interested in are what happens in the limit. If we can describe the limit of this complicated physical system, or maybe not that complicated, anyway, uh, when the mesh size is very small. So this is, you know, the, this is the, basic framework of all this business. Okay, and then <coughs> there are good news about this course and bad news. Good news are as follows. So Brownian motion is a continuum limit of the simplest possible discrete, if you wish to say, system of some discrete evolution, discrete behavior, which is a simple random walk. Just imagine you are in a city that you are not very familiar with, so you have no idea to where to go, and you just start do this totally at random. So you have some trajectory. So simple random walk. Okay, imagine this is a very regular city, like Manhattan, and uh, then you just start moving there uniformly at random at each side. So you do some, I mean, you, you go along some path, which is a random path. And of course, it's rather rough. And if you are sitting there or behind, so what you see is, okay, you can think about some limit of this, which is a continuous trajectory. So the Brownian motion is here. So this is just the name for this evolution in continuum. And as I said, okay, this is the simplest possible system. And so you can expect that many things actually can be derived and proven and so forth <coughs> and so on. Well, this is good news about the course that we are dealing with something simple. And the bad news are in the word calculus. So, okay, we are going to prove something rigorously. It's going to be epsilons and deltas, I'm sorry for this. Uh, from this perspective, maybe <coughs> this is, well, this should be said, it's rather technical course. And so so we, really, uh, we really would like to prove things about this object. And uh, <coughs> on the contrary, with other courses, we are going to do this in continuum. So the basic idea is that here we are not that much interested in the convergence theorem, of course it will be there in the course. Uh, but the general idea is that we study this object and some objects developed from it in continuum. And because of that, of course, it increases the complexity. Uh, for those who are participating in the master program, next term, you will have some courses that prove convergence of some complica more complicated systems here, like the Eason model or maybe something else, dominoes, etc to their continuum limit, limits. And there, quite often, this continuum limit is constructed using Brownian motion. So you should think about the Brownian motion as the basic building block 
of everything in continuum. So this is the, this is the very basic element like uh, in the first course of probability, the normal distribution is the very basic block for many things, okay? So then another small comment, why the name Brownian? Again, I think that many of you actually know the answer. So this is due to Brown, uh, who in one eight two seven described the motion of a big particle, actually a grain of pollen in water. So he just, you know, uh, made some observations in the microscope and again, so it's pity I cannot show you an experiment like Ivan did, but just imagine this virtual experiment. So you just see <coughs> uh, watch on a drop uh, of water in a microscope and there is actually something that is much larger than the molecules of water moving there. And so, okay, he made some pictures and it was some random movement. You should remember that that time it was not clear that actually molecules of water do exist. So, and uh, <coughs> from some perspective, it was one of, the re one of the very good motivations to develop a strict theory of all that. Okay, but now, okay, we, we are much more, uh, much more trained and all that. And uh, of course, what's happened, at least what is the contemporary explanation, is that there is this huge, huge grain of pollen and it's bumped from every side by uh, molecules of water, which are moving chaotically, and then it produces this movement. And uh, okay, here there are only positions after, I don't remember, after some fixed amount of time. So this is an approximation to the real trajectory, which we expect to be a Brownian motion. Okay, and it should be said that, of course, he was not the first who observed this effect. So there were other guys before, but by some reason, as usual with uh, the names of every law, so by some reason, this is fixed for him. Okay, <coughs> good. So just to summarize, the general idea is that we are interested in this object in continuum. So we are going to construct it, to study its properties, etc. But the motivation you should have in mind is that basically it is the limit of some of some simpler, simpler things, uh, I mean, technically simpler things in this group. Okay, <laughs> so then let me start with the set of reminders on, uh, you know, on the basic probability course. I'm sorry if I'm boring, but just, you know, to fix that we are on the same wave. So, uh, one. Uh, given a random variable, so what is the random vari what is a random variable? This is <coughs> a mapping from some space, which is called probability space omega, say to R, or maybe to some other metric space, uh, which is measurable with respect to Borel sigma algebra there and some sigma algebra there. So actually here there is sigma algebra. probability measure. So <coughs> given such, such, a, such an object, a random variable, there is a natural function assigned to it. Actually, there are many. So one of those is just uh, the distribution function, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. So what I'm going to remind you is that there is an object which is called characteristic functions. So what's that? I put here z because later on it's going, t is going to be a time. So let it be, you know, to distinguish two variables, let it be z, though it's going to be real. So this is just an expectation of i z z is real in principle you can <coughs> with no harm to uh, think about this about z as being in the upper half plane so still this is less than one and so there are no problems with convergence 
Okay, so this is the characteristic function. And what are the basic properties? The basic properties are just, it's continuous. Uh, it has zero limits at infinity. Actually, it means it's uniformly continuous. Then, <coughs> uh, well, its value at the origin is 1. And then, if this variable has moments, then you can refine this behavior, you can say what are the further terms. So basically, if it has the second moment, so if the integral of xi squared is finite, then, oops, sorry, it was the reverse. Then you, one can write, just differentiate in this guy, one plus i z mean value minus z squared over 2 mean square plus smaller, something smaller. Okay, so if it was four moments, then you can write down four terms in this expansion. And this is nothing but just differentiating of this expression under the expectation. Okay, so that's morally, morally standard <coughs> theorems from the calculus course. Okay, good. So that's about the characteristic function. Then the next reminder is convergence of random variables. So probably you remember that there are many, many <coughs> notions here, like on the sure convergence, etc. What I'm interested in is convergence in distributions. In distribution. Also known in low or weak convergence. Actually, this is the only reasonable notion when you do not assume that all the random variables uh, you have, you deal with, are defined on the same probability space. So if you have, say, a sequence of variables defined on the same probability space, on the same omega, then you can invent meaningful definitions like what happens point-wise, what happens uniform, etc. But if you are just given a sequence of random variables, each of them def being defined on its own probability space, then basically this is the only reasonable notion. So uh, what does it say? It says, okay, a sequence of variables converse. I will use this notation with just D up <coughs> upstairs. Converse to psi. If, meaning if and only if, yeah? Uh, is it true that if size is identically zero, then the characteristic function is one? Yeah, good point. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it does not tend to zero, that it tends to infinity. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry for this. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I was just thinking about Riemann Lebeck lemma. Yes, thanks a lot. <laughs> and be careful with me, so, so that you, please look on these on these things. Uh, yeah. Well. <coughs> okay. So this convergence in distribution, uh, if and only if, for every bounded and continuous function. There's expectations do converge. Okay, so you can think about, for instance, 
just the function which is a constant, then this is a meaningless statement. I mean, if the function is constant one, then one indeed converts to one. <laughs> okay, but of course you can think about more interesting functions. Uh, <coughs> so, it's tempting to think about this function being just h of x being x, right? Then we would, go, we would get the expectation. The problem is that it's not bounded. So in general, you cannot, you cannot play with that. If you know that the values of xi are uniformly bounded, then you know that the expectations do converge. Otherwise, so <coughs> this might be not the case. Uh, okay. So why the name weak convergence? So mark this is equivalent to say that the corresponding measures on the real line, which are just push forwards of measures here. So you take your probability measure here and you th think what is the distribution of the values. So weak convergence of the measures, let me call them the fn x, where this is just the probability of xi n being smaller than x. Uh, <coughs> it means that these measures on the real line weakly converge to the f x. Okay. So, well, there are many basic examples of this conversions. Then what is important is that there is a theorem, which as far as I understand is due to Paul Levy, as many other theorems in <coughs> this business. Uh, that basically tells you a very, a very nice uh, description of this convergence in terms of the characteristic functions. So it says that A sequence of random variables uh, converges to xi distribution if and only if uh, the characteristic functions of these variables converge to uh, the characteristic function of xi uh, pointwise, basically. So for easy. Um, okay, I mean from left to right, this is just a part of the definition. Because what I, what I play with this H is just the continuous bounded function here. So I just take this exponent and that's it. So what is the meaningful part of the theorem is the inverse implication. So, and <coughs> uh, for the inverse statement, uh, you can also wonder, okay, if I'm just given this sequence of functions and I know that they do converge to something pointwise, do I know that this is indeed the characteristic, the characteristic function of some random variable? So this is a meaningful question. Here it's implicitly assumed that I already have xi, and so I already have this phi of z. So <coughs> if we do not, have, do not have xi here and only limit here, then you should also impose some continuity assumption on phi. And actually you can, <coughs> it's enough to impose the weakest possible, which is uh, just continuity at the origin. So otherwise, best scenario may happen. And uh, the crucial point, just to remind you what, what can be bad, I mean, what, what can go wrong is when 
the sequence of these random variables is not tight, which means that they take, well, roughly speaking, <coughs> bigger and bigger values with constant probabilities. So if you know they are tight, then, then there is no problem in this area. But anyway, so conceptually, the, the, this, this characteristic function is just a very useful tool to study convergence of random variables in distribution. Okay? Are there any questions so far? So, if it's fine. Uh, please ask and try to find, you know, stupid things like here. <laughs> uh, okay, so what <coughs> is the next reminder? Is that there is a big theorem. Which, of course, everybody knows from the basic course. Uh, so it says <coughs> if we have a sequence of identically distributed independent random variables, independent identically distributed. And, uh, well, they have bounded second moments. Okay, okay they're, all, uh, they're all identically distributed. So basically, I can just say that okay. this finite second moment, they're all the same. Then, If you sum all them up to sum n and subtract their mean value and normalize by square root and some other constant, then what you have in the limit is a random variable with a standard Gaussian distribution. So what are A and sigma? Or oh, maybe it's, okay, let me be A. <coughs> so A is the mean value. Sigma is uh, the standard deviation. So sigma squared is Here and uh, n01 is the standard Gaussian distribution. So Gaussian with density p of x one square root of two pi minus x square root over two. Yeah, and then. I apologize for this. I'm going to remind you the proof of this theorem just because uh, the first result we are going to prove in the course is exactly of the same, of the same shape. Just let us, <coughs> let us remember how it goes. I mean, yeah. This is very easy, of course, but still. So as you might guess, or just remember, uh, guess from the introduction, uh, the only thing one should do is uh, to write down the characteristic function of this object and to see it converges to the characteristic function of this object. So <coughs> the proof. So <coughs> if I have characteristic function of <coughs> of these distributions, so they're all the same. Uh, then 
if I denote this, okay, let me, uh, let me do it a bit slower. So uh, then first it's convenient to subtract A. Just don't care about A. So then uh, the characteristic function of this guy is of course <coughs> nothing but uh, nothing but this. And then we know that it has, we can write down the local behavior near the origin. So it's given by the square over two. And then the mean is now zero. So we just have sigma squared. Okay, then we sum n copies of these, and they're all independent because of that characteristic functions are just multiplied. So, and make another normalization. So what we see is that the characteristic function of this random variable Basically, first I should uh, plug into this formula z over square root n sigma. So that's why here. And then I should power it to the n. Okay. And then, well, this is nothing but. Basically, that's it. That's the end of the proof. So this is the characteristic function of the standard normal distribution. So, Okay, quite natural proof and hopefully, well now everybody remembers how it goes. So again, just, just to make some comment on the content of the course. So as I said, we are interested in, well, some objects which are simplest possible in some respect, but nevertheless, there's a random paths say random curves or in one dimension you can think about and we will think about just random functions. So the corresponding theorem, the, there is the corresponding theorem, it's going to be maybe on this third lecture or yeah, something like that, that the trajectories of uh, <coughs> graphs of uh, random walks, they do converge to Brownian motions. And the idea is, you know, is quite similar, so this is, in some respect, a version of central limit theorem, but not for real valued random variables, uh, rather for, for random variables with values in some functional spaces for random functions. Okay, but here that's, you know, the, the very clean example. And then <coughs> yet another reminder uh, that's about Gaussian vectors. Should we open the windows? Oh, 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 oh. Uh, so, 
so it's going to be in the first set of exercises and for exercises uh, the person responsible for exercises is Marianne, she's sitting here. Uh, so <coughs> in the first set of exercises there is something about Gaussian vectors again just to remember how it goes. So uh, what do I need here? So what is a Gaussian vector? This is, you know, in a sense, an intermediate step between random variables, real value to maybe complex value, and random functions. So those are random objects in some finite dimensional space, say RD. And uh, it's called Gaussian vector. if any projection of xi on a line, so you just fix some direction in Rd, some coefficients, if for any <coughs> coefficients, this linear combination is a Gaussian variable. So this is the definition. There is an important point here. So what is the point? Uh, an example, it's fairly easy to construct an example. Just take all the components of xi to be Gaussian and independent. If, so we can just construct this multi-dimensional random variable and then of course each of the combinations is again Gaussian because the sum of two independent Gaussians uh, is again Gaussian variable. The message is that in some sense this is the only possible case. But of course, one should be careful writing this on a blackboard because uh, literally speaking, this is not always the case. This is always the case in some basis. So <laughs> the other way to see this story is to start with uh, densities, like here. So an alternative way to say what, the Gaussian what a Gaussian vector is, is to say, okay, alternatively, <coughs> is to say that there is a density which is now characterized in the scalar case we had just one number which is the mean value and the other number which is uh, the variance. And in this case the mean value, okay, it must be a vector in Rd because all the values are there. So, <coughs> and uh, we also need some replacement for the variance and the natural replacement is a D by D matrix, so which I'm going to denote by G for some reasons. It's rather similar to sigma, right? So <laughs> that's going to be G. <laughs> uh, well, okay, if I put here capital sigma, then, you know, when, with summations, it's not very useful. <coughs> so, uh, and then it should be exponent minus one half uh, x transposed uh, g minus one x. Okay. 
Yeah, and that's, yeah, so sorry for this. It should be also mean value somewhere, right? X minus A transpose minus one, X minus A. Okay, so what is, <coughs> what is what here? So A is the mean value. This is a vector in RD. And G, well, this is again a simple exercise. Actually, this is the covariance matrix of these random variables. Okay, so this is xi minus a transpose, transposed xi minus a. This is the matrix. <coughs> so here, I think about elements of Rd is about columns. So here is, is a column, here is a matrix, and here is a row. So I just multiply all them, and what I have is a number. Okay, just about the notation. Uh, so from this description, say, if we start from here, then one can think about the remark above is following. So I'm given some matrix which is by definition is positive and semi-definite, so from here this is almost obvious, and then in some basis it has a diagonal form. So this is just the very basic fact from the linear algebra. So <coughs> for any matrix G, I can find the basis such that it has a diagonal form there, and then this is a sort of an exercise to prove that indeed we, we are back to this construction with independent Gaussians. And this is mentioned in the set of exercises, so um, if you are not very familiar with this by some reason, then <coughs> you have an opportunity to discuss. Okay, so I think uh, this, these are all the reminders I had in mind. And in the remaining seven minutes of the first hour, let me discuss the notion of <coughs> stochastic process, of a stochastic process. Okay, so that would be paragraph one. Uh, with uh, the tentative name Stochastic processes with independent increments and continuous trajectories. Well, yeah, again, to the contrary, say with Ivan's course, there are no lecture notes, actually, for this course. Actually, the material is quite standard, and there are several textbooks on this. So, <coughs> uh, if you, well, the names are, okay, the, there are very formal book, books like Kallenberg, for instance, Introduction to Modern Probability, or you can read Stokvaradan. <coughs> I don't remember the name, though. So. Or there is a book by Oxendal, which is a very classical reference, as so all some proofs are missing there. Anyway, <coughs> so if you need something precise, you can just ask me in private. And we can discuss what is your level and what is more, uh, <coughs> more suitable for you. Uh, so, and because of that, the names of chapters are going you know, to, to be a bit artistic. Whatever. So, let, let us discuss the definition of a stochastic process. <coughs> so we have some probability space, as usual. So it's going to be a random object. So this is the probability space. And then, it's going to be a variable called t, 
which I think about being a time. So I think about some evolutions. Just <coughs> a comment on this. In principle, this is not the only possible viewpoint. So in particular, again, in the second term, during the second term, uh, another very fundamental object will appear, which is called Gaussian free field. And about this, you can think in a very similar manner, but then t is two-dimensional. So there is no natural, natural direction of time. And moreover, it's more, it's more complicated structure. But I'm going to think about, about evolutions in this course. So, <coughs> OK. Let me, uh, let me else uh, fix some capital T, which in principle might be plus infinity even. And then I'm thinking about objects, which I'm going to denote this way. Again, I'm going to write 0t, but it could be else uh, not including the capital T, in particular at infinity. There's just a slight abuse of the notation. So I'm intended to write t, but okay, well, t was included, but it's not necessary. So, okay, it's called a stochastic process. Let me put real valued in parentheses. If, okay. What is the type of this object? So for any given t, this is just a random variable. So this should be thought about as a collection of random variables. And for instance, Gaussian vectors, which we had here, uh, basically can be thought about as you know, processes with only very discrete set of times. Okay, with only d, d times available, which are now labeled by 1, 2, etc. So, okay, this is a collection of random variables. If <coughs> collection of random variables, variables, so each xt is a mapping from omega to r. But then there are issues. So that do not appear here. So what are the issues? <coughs> Again, as I said, unfortunately, this, is, this course has something to do with calculus. So we should be careful about details, at least, yeah, to some extent. So the question is, uh, with respect to which sigma algebra this guy is measurable? And this is not, you know, not <coughs> the empty question. The standard, <coughs> uh, standard agreement is that this mapping which takes omega in this omega sum in our probability space, and t is measurable with respect to the product sigma algebra there. So just to remember what is the product sigma algebra, tensor product sigma algebra, you just take all the possible rectangles, meaning Cartesian products of some measurable here by some measurable there, and take the smallest possible sigma algebra generated by all these this Cartesian products. Okay? So, <coughs> uh, just a remark to finish the first hour. <coughs> D 
this is stronger than to say that for every t this mapping is measurable measurable uh, with respect to me so i mean originally i just told you okay this is a collection of random variables indexed by some set then it was some blah 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 some discussion of what is of what is the measurability condition needed and then I <coughs> told you okay let it be measurable here so now I'm saying okay this is not equivalent so this is not for nothing and uh, okay this is a puzzle for a break just you know provide a counter example I mean an example why it is strictly stronger this is fairly easy. Now we have a break. And then we discuss how it works. Are there any questions for the first half? No? Okay. Okay, let us discuss just some measure theoretic issues which are not of great importance for what's going on uh, like in the second half and wait for <laughs> until everybody's here. So, uh, first, Remember, so it was some discussion that in addition to the fact that each of these guys is a random variable just indexed by, by the corresponding T, I also impose the condition, the measurability condition here. So uh, first, uh, why this is indeed strictly stronger? There are, well, many ridiculous examples. So for instance, an example. You know, <coughs> there are, I mean, not all the subsets of zero T are in the barrel sigma algebra. So this is not the collection of all subsets. So in the construction of Lebesgue integrals of, of any integral, there are some issues with this. So take some non-measurable set of times, non-measurable set of times <coughs> B and then define take and the probability space is trivial this is just the set of two points basically the result of a flip coin and omega is just had its states Then you flip this coin and assign the indicator function of B if heads, if omega is heads, and indicator function of the complement If, if it stays. So the process is, you know, is very ridiculous. I mean, the, the, this function is just either one on a given deterministic set and zero outside of this set, set or the way around. Okay? So clearly, for any given time, this function is just 0, 1. I mean, this is a function of from the set of cardinality 2 to 0, 1. Of course, this is measurable. I mean, there are no issues at all. And of course, it is not measurable. Uh, <coughs> I mean, this, this mapping of t and omega together is not measurable with respect to any reasonable sigma algebra. So the motivation to fight with such examples is that later on we are going to define some integrals of these guys. And moreover, integrals of some processes with respect to other processes. 
And the, as in any other integration theory, there are measurability issues. And you cannot hope for, for a good theory if you do not forbid such, such things. Okay? <coughs> this is sort of an explanation. And uh, another remark, let me also uh, state it here. So another remark, maybe here. So this is remark A, and this is B, is <coughs> as follows. So in principle, look, here there was another saying with continuous trajectories. Of course, this guy is not continuous at all. I mean, in T. So this is not a continuous function. So if by some reason we know that xt is a reasonable function of t, either we assume it or we derive it from somewhere, etc., then one can think about Think about x being a mapping from our probability space, omega, to some functional space. For instance, the space of continuous functions or some other, some other functional space. Provided we have such an assumption, or we derived it. I mean, so, <coughs> so if we know by some reason that these guys are continuous, then we can think about this mapping, right? We know XT is continuous. <coughs> and then one can impose the measurability condition for this mapping, that it's measurable with respect to sigma algebra here and Borel sigma algebra there in this functional space. Okay? There's also a very natural viewpoint. Okay? Then, <coughs> then, Okay, the natural condition is that see, x is measurable. <coughs> with respect to A and Borel sigma algebra there. In all reasonable functional spaces, for all reasonable functional spaces, I mean with continuous trajectories and better, it's enough to know the values of this guy at a countable, many, at a countable number of points. I mean, to characterize a continuous function, it is enough to know its values in dyadic rationals, for instance. So <laughs> the bottom line of this discussion is that if we know that the trajectories are continuous, then basically this is equivalent to, 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 to that. That for any given t, this mapping is measurable. Just because this is generated by countably many evaluation mappings. Okay. Uh, apart from this discussion, so if you <coughs> didn't quite follow, okay, just maybe take a look later on on videotapes. They are going to be on the website, but not this week. So in principle, later on they should appear basically the same day or maybe tomorrow after the lecture, but this week we are just, you know, setting things up and <coughs> it's not totally fixed. Okay, if you didn't quite follow, just never mind at this point. <laughs> just remember that, okay, we have this definition and there were some issues 
with measurability, which should be should be dealt with care. Okay, and now I'm going to formulate the first theorem of this course. Oh, and before I need another definition. So, so we saw Gaussian vectors. Now, let me say what is a Gaussian process. As I mentioned, it should be a generalization of Gaussian vectors, of Gaussian vectors. So. is called Gaussian process. If for any set of times, fixed times, This random variable, which is okay, just a random variable with values in, defi in the finite dimensional space in Rd, is a Gaussian vector. So again, there is a more general viewpoint here. More generally, let me just comment briefly in words. More generally, remember how it was with Gaussian vectors. So it was an object in Rd, and we took linear functionals of it. We took this linear combination, C1, okay, all the projections, all the linear functions, all the functionals that are available in Rd. So here we took only evaluation operators, right? Instead of this, we could take all the linear functionals, like the mean value over t of this guy, just the integral over zero t of x t, etc., and ask that all the linear functionals are Gaussian variables. Again, apart from some bad. Uh, bad cases, this is equivalent to each other. So you can think that any linear functional can be approximated by these guys. So conceptually, this is the same. In bad cases, some issues arise. <coughs> okay, so this is the definition of uh, the definition of a Gaussian process. And uh, okay, now I'm yeah, I'm able to formulate the first theory. And let me start again with describing to where we go. Uh, so the idea is to construct the limit of random walks of some processes defined in discrete. And actually in many textbooks this is exactly how the Brownian motion is constructed and we will take another route for some reason. Okay, so what do we know, what, what is reasonable to assume about this limiting process, about this random function? So let xt be a stochastic process. Basically, with these two assumptions, uh, with independent increments and continuous trajectories, I'm going to write them down, such that A, for any collection of disjoint 
intervals scale to k. random variables, the increments, let me just call them, the increments over these intervals, time intervals are independent. Okay, so this is a natural assumption for such a time evolution, so if something happened with me during this random walk last year, and something is going on right now, so these things are independent. So I'm totally forgetting about what was before. Okay? Is clear what, what I assume? And B, uh, this process has continuous trajectories. Which a priori is not, I mean, quite immediate. Why nothing bad can happen in the limit with a random walker? But intuitively, still, it's quite reasonable. So I mean, something should be proven here. But intuitively, it seems quite reasonable. So the probability that this is a continuous function on zero t is one. How do I know this is measurable? I mean, how do I know this is an event in my sigma algebra? Okay, yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. So, uh, there are, well, uh, Well, there, there are se se several approaches, I mean, <coughs> there are several ways uh, to say. So, first, uh, I mean, the, the formal way of saying mm -hmm. is to say that even if it's not measurable, okay. if it's not measurable, I try to find a we bigger can, event. We can say that the, the outer The measure of the complement is zero. So this is <coughs> I mean this is the same discussion uh, similar so so if you don't follow just you might remember in the theory of Lebesgue integrals there are sets of Lib outer Lebesgue measure zero, which are not in the Borel sigma algebra. The worst is tricky issue, and there because of this fact, so one of the, one of the ways to to speak about all this uh, formally is to say, okay, I start with all Borel sets, and then I construct, <coughs> I mean, my Lebesgue measure on Borel sets, and then I declare everybody which is inside of a measurable set of measure zero to be measurable too with measure zero. This is called the completion of the measure. But then I have to say that every random variable is measurable with respect to Lebesgue uh, sigma algebra if I add those uh, events. What do you mean? Here it's not Lebesgue, right? You're adding every event of probability zero. Of probability zero, yeah. So I'm adding all those events in the sigma algebra. Right. So then I should ask that every random values going from omega to r must be measurable to no. the sigma algebra with the. I don't. I don't ask you that. I just ask. Uh, no, no, no. You, you just improve the, the state. The, okay. You just improve the statement that you okay. just. Okay. The other option is just to say, okay, instead. I mean, it depends on how this pro, how this pro, uh, process appeared. That okay, it might be very bad on some. On some events of outer measure zero. And let us just modify it in any reasonable way just to, to declare it to be constant zero on these events. Uh, the third point is uh, to deal with, uh, with uh, variables like this and to say <coughs> that 
okay, in principle, I could work with values only at dyadics. And this is enough to say if they describe some continuous function or not in time. And this is the point we will, we will discuss on the second lecture, I mean, not now. The easiest, the easiest improvement is, is here. That even if this event is not measurable, it still makes sense to say it has probability zero. But this is a very good question. Yeah, thanks. Okay. <coughs> uh, okay, the increments are independent and the probability is one. Then, this is a Gaussian process. Let's just discuss what's going on. In a sense, this is a version of a central limit theorem. So why? Just think about a single, oh, uh, yeah, and I forgot an assumption. It should be said something about the Sturgeon value. Otherwise, it cannot be, it cannot be the case. So you, you could have a crazy distribution of x node such that say x naught is zero for definite. Otherwise I can just I can just add something independent of T, some crazy random variable, and of course it's not Gaussian. Okay, just imagine we would like to conclude that X T at given T is a Gaussian. And conceptually this is the only one thing we need uh, because <coughs> We know that increments are independent. And if we are able to prove that a single increment is Gaussian, that of, then of course um, any such vector is, uh, <coughs> is Gaussian too. So okay, we need to deduce that the value at a given point is Gaussian. The reason why this is the case is of course here. Because it can be split into many, many independent components. Um, we do not assume they are identically distributed. So we cannot just apply the central limits here, right? But you might heard that, okay, there are versions of central limit theorem. Uh, it's not necessary that the guys are identically distributed, so you can impose, impose uh, <coughs> milder assumptions. And here the assumptions is in continuity. So I'm just hand waving. This is not the proof, and we are going to go through the proof. But the assumptions on the assumption that forbids best scenario is exactly the continuity. Otherwise, this is the central limit theory. Okay. And already this theorem it tells us that Thinking about a, a continuum limit of this discrete random walker, there are not that much possibilities, right? So it must be a Gaussian process. And then, okay, there are some other assumptions which are still not there. For instance, that these guys are actually identically distributed. That would lead us to a very concrete process in continuum. Okay, let us start the proof. Right. Do we yeah. need something about like being zero? Or uh -huh. Do we need something about the elements being zero? Or, you know? Here? No, no, the, 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 like, so the increments are independent, but, um, like, isn't, oh, oh, wait. No, 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 it's not a reunion. No, it's not a mystery. Why? Okay. You can just start. Yeah. It's not necessarily centered. Uh, well, this is not a, not a big issue, what, what, what is the mean value, but it's not necessary. <laughs> okay, so the first remark note that it is enough to prove that
This is a Gaussian variable. for any S and T. Why? Just because of the independence, right? So if we know this is a Gaussian variable, then we know did. If we know this, then we know that This is a Gaussian vector. And then this is just the linear change of, of uh, these variables. Okay, so if we know that some vector is Gaussian, then we, we can apply any linear transform to it, and this is still Gaussian. And this is due to independence. Is it clear? I mean, if we, we are able to prove that a single increment is Gaussian, then this vector is Gaussian because it's formed by independent Gaussian variables. And then what we need is just a linear transform of this, which is still Gaussian. OK, good. And then, of course, I can assume, oh, OK, let me even do not assume it. I was, I was tempted to say, let us assume that S is zero because it, we do not lose any generality. But, okay, never mind. <coughs> now I'm trying to implement a very general strategy. I need some notation. <coughs> so let me denote by T, G, N. What I'm doing, I just take my interval and split it into many pieces. So it's going to be TGM here, which is S plus J over M T minus S. Okay. <coughs> then of course, the idea is to say that the increment over ST is just a sum of many independent increments. So let me introduce this random variable, which is just an increment, the increment over over this small segment. This is just the notation, nothing happens. Then, remember it might be a problem, so in principle I do not know much about these random variables. In particular, for a given random variable, I do not know if it's bounded by something or not. And I'm going to, to play with characteristic functions with some convergences like in the central limit theorem, but in principle it might be some problem. Because of that, <coughs> I fix some epsilon, and to be honest, it's going to depend on n later on. But for a while, let us think it is fixed. So I just fix some cutoff. Later on, I'm going to put here a subindex n or superindex n to be consistent. So let me define truncated random variables. So 
so for, for these guys, I should be able to apply some version of the central limit theorem. I have a uniform bound. It, it's, going to, it's going to happen on a BlackBerry, but this is the idea. For these guys, <coughs> it should not be a problem. But still, I have some bad events that they do, that they do not consult. Uh, okay, let us think about these bad events. So, uh, what is the probability? And let me let me put it in some other color that these are going to depend on n later on. Okay, what is the probability that my random variable, and let me call it xi, <coughs> is not a sum, is not the sum of these two things. Basically, this is the probability that something bad happened, right? This is definitely less than the sum of probabilities of these events. Now let me keep it in another color. Still, it's going to depend on n, but right now it's fixed. <clears throat> so, what I'm saying is that, okay, let, let, let me, sorry, let me write it down in some other way. So that's, that's maybe, yeah, sorry. It's the probability that maximum of these guys is greater than himself. So what I'm saying is that this tends to zero as n tends to infinity. <coughs> At least for a fixed epsilon. So why? Imagine it does not. So we have some amount of probability that bad things happen at scale n, at scale n plus one, at scale n plus two, etc. So imagine that along some subsequence, these probabilities are greater than 100, I mean 1%, okay? So otherwise, if these probabilities are greater than epsilon uh, are bounded by some constant from below along the subsequence. Often k. We necessarily have that with probability at least c, infinitely many of these events actually happen. many of these happens is else at least C. Just imagine you have 1% of your space when the first event happened, then 1% of your space where the second, for, and for in two, a bad thing happened, etc. So, and there are infinitely many of them. So, and then what I'm saying <coughs> is that Okay, the only, the only possibility is that infinitely many happens with this probability. And this is impossible because we know that the trajectory is continuous with probability one. This contradicts to our continuity assumption. <coughs> 
So the local bottom line is that this probability tends to zero for fixed epsilon. But then, there is an easy consequence. Uh, which uh, says the following. So we know, we already know, let me rewrite it here, that <coughs> this probability of some bad things <coughs> tends to zero for epsilon n being epsilon fixed. <coughs> and then what I'm saying is that I can even push this statement a bit further, I mean, to make it a bit stronger. And I can say that there exists a decreasing sequence of epsilons. such that this probability still tends to zero. So this is a bit tricky. Remember, <laughs> definition of this guy depends on epsilon, right? So, so I'm not writing it here, but remember it was there in the construction. So <coughs> why this is the case? Uh, uh, well, okay, this is a simple exercise. So just imagine you take epsilon one half, say, and wait until the probability of this event is less than one half. Say this happens for n, whatever, 100, right? Then you declare, okay, after 100, let my epsilon be one half. Then you take epsilon one third and wait until this probability is one third. Let it happen at the number 1,000. Then you say, okay, in between 100 and 1,000, my epsilon is one half, later on it's one third. Then you take one, so this should be done, just, just think about it. <coughs> okay, so this was, well, some part of technicalities. Uh, what we have now is that we have these refining truncations, right? So while n grows, I mean, this truncation is smaller and smaller. So because of this reasoning, what we gained is that now our variable xi is split, I mean, with almost one probability, is split into a sum of a big amount of random variables, each of them less than epsilon n, which also goes to zero. So we have something very, very well adapted for, for the central limit theorem. Okay. Uh, so, and now what we should do is just to repeat the proof of central limit theorem, I think except some other technicality that we do not know anything about mean values of these guys and their variances. So, <coughs> okay, let us denote by, okay, let us denote A, G, M, the expectations of eta Uh, sigmas be variances of eta, so this is the expectation of the square minus square. And uh, uh, let this be the characteristic function Eta. <coughs> and uh, OK, 
okay, let us write down what, do we know, what we know about this characteristic function. So basically we know that since this is bounded, that was the whole idea of this truncation. Since this is bounded, we know that this one, again, let me subtract, uh, subtract the mean value. So to do so, put it here. We know this guy is 1 minus z squared over 2 ajn squared plus and I'm not just writing all small of z squared now. I need a better control so what I write is O Z cube expectation of omega G N cube. So since my variable is bounded, I can write the Taylor expansion with, you know, with the constructive estimate of the error. So definitely cannot have more than this. And, uh, okay, by the way, this is less than z cube over by, uh, by epsilon by Okay, I'm, I'm sorry for this. Well, one we need to correct this a bit, so I've subtracted subtracted the mean value. So here it must be expectation of minus ag cube, <coughs> agn cube. Oof. And this is sigma. So what happened? Here is just the third moment. What I'm saying is that, and here it might be another two. Uh, what I'm saying is that let me split this cube into the first power, which I have a control of, which is epsilon, and everything the rest. And everything the rest is controlled by the second moment. Okay? So, yeah? This is an expansion near z equal to zero, but since I write here O capital, I don't need to assume that z tends to zero, actually. So it's valid in, in every neighborhood of, yeah, of zero, including actually very big ones. So in the very big ones, so here the expo this is exponential is of order one, and this is something huge. So there are no problems, even on big <coughs> intervals. So it's valid in any, neighborhood of the, of the origin. <clears throat> okay, so what is the bottom line? The bottom line is that here I can write it this way. And here it's sigma also. No, this is the second moment. I can write it this way. I have this term. Remember, this is what, what, should, what should give me the normal distribution at the end of the day. And everything else is smaller as n tends to zero. Why? Just because of this guy. It should be a question now from here. Uh, so let us just just discuss this briefly and then <coughs> then stop until the next week. So where is z and where is n here? What I'm saying is that 
we have such an expansion which is uniform in any neighborhood uniform in Z in any neighborhood of the origin. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is that I have the control of the remainder, which is universal. So it was the cube here, but if I'm in a given neighborhood, then okay, it's just a, another constant here. So <laughs> just the bottom line, of what happened so far. Actually, we are rather close to, uh, to the end of the proof, but it takes maybe 10 minutes, and uh, so I should stop here. So what is the bottom line? The bottom line is that <coughs> we would like to analyze what could be a limit, I mean, what could be a natural object. And the, the central limit theorem suggests us that basically everything should be Gaussian. And the theorem I'm in the middle of proof, in the middle of the proof of, uh, <coughs> just justifies this fact that if I know that trajectories are continuous, then it must be Gaussian. So what is the idea of the proof? Is just to split this increment into many independent components. So this is some technical part which does it. Here we already have something which is very close, I mean, to the, to the proof of the CLT, and that's what's going to be finished next time. Okay. Thanks for the attention, and if there are any questions. Well, if not, then it's going to be an exercise session with Marianne. So you're welcome to discuss Gaussian vectors. And also there is some reminder or maybe some information about the Fourier transform in the exercise sheet. So if you are very familiar with Gaussian vectors, just you know, take a look there. Okay, see you next week. <laughs>